There's a little question mark at the end of the title that's deliberate and, and doing a little bit of work there. Um, the, uh, the point of my talk is to sort of examine what um, we've learned since Darwin about the role of what Darwin identified as natural selection um, in maintaining or affecting the variation within animal species or within populations. Um, and it's a question that Darwin was very interested in. Uh, and um, of course, he published his most famous work, The Origin of Species, by means of natural selection. And he was where he laid out this concept of natural selection. Um, and so uh, before we sort of get into any of the details of the talk, I want to make sure we're all on the same page of, about what we mean when we say natural selection. Um, so uh, natural selection sort of relies on, on three main components, the first being that there is variation within a species or within populations of a species. And one of Darwin's favorite examples was the variation he saw in pigeon breeds. Now, these are not wild pigeons very much. They're mostly domesticated. And just like we see different breeds of dogs, um, there were pigeon fa uh, fanciers in Victorian England who bred different breeds of pigeon. Um, and uh, there's been some recent work on this um, by the Shapiro Lab in Utah, where they're trying to understand the genetic basis of this variation. But um, Darwin observed variation in the pigeons he saw, as well as a bunch of different organisms that he was observing and said, you know, he wanted to understand this variation within the species, where it comes from, um, what is responsible for it. Now, for Darwin's idea of natural selection to work, you can't just have variation. That variation has to be what we call heritable. So what does that mean, heritable? It means that because of genetic reasons, we often look like our parents. So um, you can see little Tom Brady next to Tom Brady. Who, you feel free to boo if you want. Um, so uh, you know he looks like his dad because they are genetically related, just like you likely look like your parents. Or if you have children, you look like your children and your other relatives. And we see this a lot, right? People look like their parents. The reason they do is because they're inheriting um, the same genes that their parents have. So we have variation. That variation has to be caused by genetics. Um, and then lastly, and, and most importantly, is that that genetically caused variation has to affect an organism's ability to survive and reproduce, right? So for example, um, on this plant, does anyone, does anyone see something on that plant? If you don't, then the thing that's hiding there is doing a really good job, okay? So there's a little insect on that plant, okay? Um, so that insect is camouflaged on that plant. That camouflage is beneficial because it allows that, that, that insect to survive and then go on to reproduce. And we see this all over the place. Here's a stick insect camouflaging itself very well um, on the uh, twig that it's climbing on, okay? So this idea of survival and reproduction we refer to as fitness, okay? So um, we need to have variation within a, within a species. That variation has to be genetically determined. And then we need that variation to have effects on, ability, on the organism's ability to survive and reproduce. And that's the core concept of natural selection that was illustrated by Darwin and has been studied by biologists for um, you know, over 100 years since Darwin. Uh, so, um, Darwin was very interested in variation. So beyond just his, his book on natural selection, he uh, wrote about the variation in animals and plants under domestication, right? So he was focused on natural variation, also domestic variation, like I showed you with the pigeons. Um, and so we see this variation across species. So these are all mammals, okay? These are all, you know, furry things that produce milk for their offspring. They're mammals. Um, and they all look very different. They all have um, occupy different sort of ecological niches where they're very effective, either in the water, on land, in the air, underground, wherever they live. And then we also see variation within species. So um, all these dog breeds, just like Darwin's pigeons, the dogs that we're familiar with, they're all members of the same species, a very variable species um, with a lot of variation. Okay, so Darwin, um, in addition to observing the pigeons that his uh, the Victorian contemporaries were studying, um, also traveled, right? So he went to uh, the Galapagos Islands famously. Um, and on the islands, you know, he observed also this variation within species, these differences between species, 
and this adaptation to different ecological habitats. And one of his um, most famous organisms that he studied were the finches, um, these birds on the Galapagos. Um, and he identified all sorts of different morphological characteristics, the beak shape, the body size. Um, and, he, and he wanted to understand how did this variation come about. And since Darwin, people have gone back to the Galapagos and studied these finches. And they've done things like observe them over time. Okay, and so when they go and look at these finches over time, they can capture them and they can measure within this one species of finch, for example, they can measure the depth of the beak. Okay, and you can imagine that the, the shape and size of that beak is um, what allows that bird to eat particular types of food, for example, seeds. So a larger beak would be better at crushing larger seeds. Maybe a smaller beak would be better at getting smaller seeds. Okay, it's sort of a, you know, one, one idea. And you can see that over time, um, so here's 40 years worth of data, over time, the depth of the beak changes. And you can see it kind of went up a little bit in the 80s and then started going down um, after that. And there were some steep drop-offs, some leveling offs. And one thing that's notable here is that right around where this first, that, that big drop happened in the late 80s, there was a drought. And that drought affects the availability of seeds on the islands. And because of the, um, the change in the availability of seeds, the size of the beak that is optimized for that particular food source changes. And the individuals with smaller beaks are better able at surviving and reproducing. And so the population over time changes through, the, through those individuals with smaller beaks having more children the population changes so that the individuals have smaller beaks. Okay, so this is sort of the, you know, some of the fundamental concepts um, that, that Darwin um, identified and then other people over the past over 100 years have gone on to study. Um, and one sort of unifying concept in a lot of this work is this concept of diversity, right? We have variation within species, we have differences between species, and that has implications, for example, in conservation biology. If we want to maintain that diversity in the face of collapsing population sizes or vanishing um, ranges where those organisms can live, right? And um, it's been argued by some that that biological diversity that we're so, that we're so uh, focused on maintaining is really the genetic diversity, right? We want to maintain the genetic diversity within the populations because as Darwin illustrated and other people have worked on, we know that in order for evolution, for adaptation to happen, for natural selection to work, we need genetic variation that affects the phenotypes. And so what I'm going to talk about a little bit next is what is the connection there between biological diversity and the, the underlying genetics that, that gives us that diversity? So we can imagine some relationship between the genetic variation, which we'll call the genotype, or the, gen or the individual's genetic makeup, which we call the genotype, and the individual's phenotype or their appearance, you know, how they look, what they do, anything about the organism um, that potentially could affect their survival, reproduction, um, whatever we're interested in. And this idea of genetics affecting phenotype was worked out, you know, initially by um, a Austrian monk that many of you are probably familiar with, Gregor Mendel, right? Who is contemporary of Darwin, but um, they seem to have almost no communication with each other. Maybe they, they, there was a book sent from one to the other, but um, very little communication. But what, Dar what Mendel worked on is fundamental for us to have a modern understanding of Darwin. And so Mendel worked on these, mostly on these pea plants, and he identified how genetically you get, for example, different flower colors or different um, shapes or colors of the seed pods. All right. So this is understanding the underlying genetics to give rise to these phenotypes, these physical appearances. And about a half century after Mendel, in the early 20th century, there was more important advances in this made by Thomas Hunt Morgan. Okay, Thomas Hunt Morgan. Um, was sort of the, the first great American geneticist. And he worked on these little uh, fruit flies, Drosophila, and he tried to understand how differences between individuals in Drosophila 
are caused by genetic differences between those individuals. So here we have a red-eyed and a white-eyed individual. Um, he determined, you know, he, he worked with his group to identify the, um, the genetics of how you get those different eye colors, okay? So we now can take what Mendel and Morgan and all the other geneticists have done, and we can apply it to Darwin's ideas, all right? And so if we come back to this concept of diversity within species and we frame it as genetic diversity, we have some predictions that were made by, um, by other biologists. That includes this prediction that as a population gets bigger, it will have more genetic diversity, all right? And in terms of the conservation question that I raised earlier, we can think, well, if population size is an important component of conservation, right, as the population collapses, it makes hard, becomes harder to conserve, then can we just measure the genetic diversity within a species as a sort of proxy for how, how big the population size is or how robust it is to extinction? Okay, so that's one idea. Um, and then adding a little bit more dimension to this, some people have proposed that um, when you have what's, what we'll call an outbred population, so this is a big population where individuals are not mating with their relatives, and you compare it to an inbred population, so that's one where it's small, individuals are mating with their relatives, and, and as we sort of all kind of intuitively understand, it's not the best idea to mate with your close relatives. Um, in what we'll think of as an optimal environment, it really doesn't matter that much if you're inbred or outbred. But when the environment becomes stressful, you sort of accentuate the effects of inbreeding, okay? So if you're in a stressful environment and it's an inbred population, the individuals in that population will be less happy. They'll be less likely to survive and less likely to reproduce, okay? Whereas the outbred population might be more resilient, all right? It'll be able to survive that stressful condition. And we actually have some evidence for this. So this is work done in harbor seals, which gives me an excuse to put up a picture of a very cute harbor seal. Um, and what these individuals did is they, they compared um, harbor seals that had this lung worm. Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a worm that lives in the lung. And you can imagine that's not a good thing to happen, right? You don't want to have worms living inside of you, right? So they compared individual harbor seals with lung worms to those that were healthy, that had no lung worms. And they observed that there was more genetic variation in the healthy individuals than the sick individuals, all right? So this is consistent with this idea, right, of the, the outbred individuals, the ones that have more genetic variation, when there is this lung worm floating around in the natural ecosystem, are less likely to be infected by it, will be happier, the inbred individuals, when they're exposed to that lung worm, are going to get sick and are going to be less likely to survive and reproduce. Okay, so all of this sort of hints at this idea that perhaps genetic variation is a good proxy metric for phenotypic variation. Now, that seems like a very fundamental concept, this relationship between genetic variation within um, within species and phenotypic variation within those species. You'd think we'd have a pretty good grasp on that relationship um, because it's sort of fundamental to a lot of the ideas in evolutionary biology, but in fact, we don't. And that's why there's a question mark there. Okay, so there hasn't been a lot of work on this. Um, we don't understand very much. And so what I'll tell you about briefly is some work um, that my lab has done to kind of address that relationship between genetic variation and phenotypic variation. So this is work that was done by a graduate student in my lab, Bukula Agontuase, um, and she was working on the flat-headed kusamanse. Um, it is a dwarf mongoose found in Nigeria and other parts of Western Africa. Um, so there's where it lives in green on, the, on this map of Africa. And there, there's a few other dwarf mongoose species around in that area. Um, and this is the one that she happened to be studying. Um, and these guys, are pretty, uh, pretty well off. They're not endangered. Um, they're, they're not going to go extinct anytime soon, um, most likely. Um, but they are, there is sort of some risk, so they are hunted for bushmeat. Um, and so you can go into markets and purchase your um, dwarf mongoose 
uh, and, and bring it home for dinner if you'd like. Um, and what, uh, what Bukula did is she actually took or bought um, animals from hunters uh, in two different parts of Nigeria. And Nigeria is uh, split by a couple of rivers. The notable one here is the River Niger, um, which runs down um, through the country and divides sort of our, our, our sampling region into two parts. We have west of the river and east of the river. Okay, and so she compared individuals from either side um, of the river. And when she did that, she measured them. So she measured, for example, their length. And, and this is just the data she collected. You don't really have to worry about understanding it, but just know that she measured the length of the individuals in the west and the east. Um, and she measured other things like the length of their tail, how long their hind limbs are, how long their forelimbs are, how long their snouts, their noses are. And she observed only two of those five things were different between the west and the east, the length of the forelimb and the length of the snout. Then we took all of this variation that she measured and we sort of captured it into a single measurement of the phenotypic variation, okay? And the, the, the take home here is that if you look at the individuals from the west, which are the W's here, they're more spread out. The individuals from the east, the E's, are more compressed into a small range. And so we say there's more variation in the west than the east. Okay, so we know that we have a, a measure of phenotypic variation, and we know that it's, these guys are more variable in the west than the east. And so then we can ask, how does this relate to genetic variation? Can we determine if there's a relationship between these uh, genetics and, and phenotypic variation? So we then applied um, sort of a genomic approach to, to measure genetic variation. Uh, and um, this is showing you the West. And we, we assign these, the genetics into two clusters. The take home here is that the Western individuals seem to have both clusters and the East is only one cluster. So the East has less genetic variation. All the individuals look more similar. The individuals look more different in the West, so more genetic variation in the West. And so we have agreement then, there's more genetic variation in the West and there's more phenotypic variation in the West. And so we can, maybe this question mark is a line, okay? And so we think maybe that if you increase genetic variation, you do increase phenotypic variation. But this is an area where we really need to know a lot more um, and, and potentially has implications. So getting back to our genotype phenotype relationship, you can, uh, probably uh, perceive that it's not just this simple, right? The way you look does not just depend on your genotype, okay? It's really easy. If you have long hair, you can go out and get a haircut. You're gonna look totally different, right? You go out in the sun, you get a tan. You're gonna look totally different, right? Um, so environment is important, okay? So environment is very important. And you can um, sort of visualize this here with another little graph where a phenotype can change across environments. And there's been some really beautiful work on this since Darwin to understand this relationship, okay? And so, for example, these are uh, data from a, a big experiment done on uh, yarrow plants, okay? And these were done in California. And California stretches from the coast, inland through the mountains, um, up into, you know, the high Sierras, right? And so you can take uh, plants, plant them on the coast, on the valley, up in the mountains, and way up at the mountaintop. And you can compare how they grow. And this particular yarrow cannot grow near the ocean. Okay, the guy, they die at the coast, they die in the valley. You got to put them up in the mountains to survive. Okay, so phenotype here, if you measure it as the size of the plant, depends on where you try to plant this thing to grow. Okay, a plant that grows well in Houston is probably not going to grow well in New England, right? Something that grows well in New England is not going to grow well in Houston for the most part. Some things are more robust, but, you know, it really depends on where you are is how successful you are. But the, the other layer on this is it kind of depends on where you come from. So these guys that are really good at growing up in the mountains are from the mountains. They have genotypes that are adapted to the mountains, and that's why they grow well there. And there's individuals that are from lower down, 
so maybe the mid mountains here, but also from the coast, those individuals grow much better when you put them down lower. All right, so if you're adapted for a particular environment, you do well in that environment and you don't do as well if you move to another environment. So we refer to this sort of effect of both your genetic makeup and your environment as a genotype by environment interaction. Okay, so you might do really well with one particular genotype as you move up in environment, but another genotype might get much worse as it moves up in environment. And here we're talking about phenotypes, but if we want to really tie this back into Darwin and evolution, it's not the phenotype we should be interested in, it's the fitness, right? Fitness is what we want, right? We want to know how well, not just, not just what you look like, but how well you survive and reproduce, okay? And what gets fun is you can just keep throwing things on top of this. So we can consider both environment and sex, all right? And we can ask the question, is what's good for the goose really good for the gander, um, right? So this idea that if it's good for a male, is it good for a female? And we can kind of draw complicated lines where we add sex and genotype to fitness and you can kind of try to make sense of that tangle of lines. But we have actual examples where people have studied this. And so some of this comes from uh, guppies in Trinidad. So these Trinidad and guppies, you can go into um, different areas along a river, okay? And in, depending on where you are in the river, there's more predators or there's fewer predators. Now at the same time, males really, really, really wanna be flashy to attract female mates, okay? So the problem with that though is the flashier the male is, the easier it is for a predator to come get him. Now females, they don't wanna be flashy at all. So females just wanna avoid predators, survive, and then mate with males. But because males have this sort of conflicting desire to be flashy, while at the same time getting eaten more, the flashier they are, what ends up happening is you only find really flashy males where there's not very many predators. And when there are predators, you don't see flashy males because those individuals cannot survive and reproduce because they can't survive because they get eaten before they can do anything, okay? So there's sort of these conflicts between what's good for males and good for females, and it could depend on the environment. And so um, one way to study this is by comparing, um, or one, one reason this, is, this gets complicated is because males and females have opposing interests potentially, right? Males might want one thing to be flashy and females want not, don't wanna be flashy, they just wanna survive, okay? But they share the same genetics, right? So how do you resolve this issue of different interests but basically working with the same blueprint, right? So you're, basically, you're trying to build two different houses, the male house and the female house, but the architect hands you one set of blueprints, right? problem, right? To, to build two very different things from the same set of blueprints. And so th there's one area where these things are different. It's on the sex chromosomes. And, and we study the sex chromosomes to kind of understand that. Um, but, um, and, and potentially that's important um, for understanding how uh, these, these sort of conflicts are resolved. Um, so I'll give you one more example of, of one of these conflicts. Um, this is uh, from cichlid fish in Lake Malawi in Africa, all right? And, and uh, they come in two different versions. There's a striped version and a spotted version, okay? And this is a picture of a striped female and a spotted female. Uh, now, the females here, when they are striped, they're very dark colored and they show up against the rocks on the bottom of the lake, which means predators can see them and eat them. The spotted females, can camouflage against the rocks and they're harder to be eaten. And you might not even see the female on there. I've tried to draw an arrow pointing to her, but you might not even see her, which sort of illustrates the point, right? Um, now males also can be striped and spotted. Uh, they're a different color than the females. The problem, with, the problem with the males is when they're spotted, they're less attractive to females, okay? So the spotted, fe the spotted females, 
are good at camouflaging and surviving. The striped males are better at reproducing. And so you have this conflict that's going on in this system. And there's actually evidence that this was resolved using the sex chromosomes. Okay, that one part of the genome that we are allowed to have differences between males and females. All right, um, so I'll give you uh, an example now from my lab where we're trying to understand how does this translate into situations where we have environmental variation. Okay, so here in this example with these fish, the, um, the environment is pretty constant, okay? The females want to be camouflaged, the males want to be flashy and striped. But as I pointed out with the guppies, we don't always have a consistent environment, okay? Um, and so we're studying uh, some flies that live uh, along the East Coast of the United States and actually everywhere. Um, and we're interested in how temperature changes as you move north and south along the East Coast. So this is work a graduate student, Kieran, in my lab has been doing. Um, and we know that there's basically two different versions of these flies. We'll call them the green ones and the orange ones, okay? Um, and they're genetically different. The green ones are found in the north, the orange ones in the south, and in between you find a few of both of them, okay? So these orange ones, because they're found in the south, we have this prediction, maybe they're better at tolerating heat. And so what Kieran did is he took those flies and raised them up, the two different versions, the green and the orange, um, and he raised them at low and high temperature, and then he put them in this absurdly high temperature, 53 degrees Celsius, okay? Um, it's halfway between, uh, it's halfway to, to boiling from freezing, okay, right? It's, I, I don't know if someone maybe can pull out their phone and tell me what that is in Fahrenheit, but um, because we do science, we don't measure things in Fahrenheit, but then it becomes really hard to communicate. People don't intuitively think. Did anyone look it up? No? It's hot. There we go. 53 degrees is hot. Okay, and so we said, if we grow these guys up, we expect, what? 120 something. Okay, hot. All right, so we take these guys, we grow them up, we have reasons to believe that if they grow at high temperature, they actually do better in the hot temperature. So if you're from Houston, maybe you do better in the summers here than if you're like me from Los Angeles, where it doesn't get hot or humid and um, you, you try to move here and survive, okay? So, um, so we did as we said, okay, can we measure the, to the, the time till they like just kick the bucket at 53 degrees? So we'll call that heat tolerance. And we know that if you grow them at high temperatures, they actually do better at tolerating heat. But importantly, the ones that do the best are the ones that are from the south, okay? So if you're adapted to the heat in the south, you grow up then in the heat, you're gonna do really well in the heat. And we take the same thing for the north, right? So these guys from the north, if they're adapted for the north, they have, they have a genotype that's really good in the north, um, are they going to be better at, at tolerating cold? So we do the same experiment. We expect the northern ones, these green ones, to be really good at tolerating cold. And we measure how long it takes for them to kick the bucket in a refrigerator. Okay, that's our cold experiment. That's four degrees Celsius is the temperature of your refrigerator. Um, and so uh, the higher up you are, the more cold tolerant you are. And yes, if you grow up in a cold environment and you get stuck in the refrigerator, you're gonna survive longer, but importantly, you are going to survive the best if you have that genotype from the north where it's cold, you grow up in the cold and you survive better. So we have this picture where we have um, northern individuals growing in the, up in the cold do the best, southern individuals growing up in the heat do the best with heat tolerance, okay? Now, the reason I mention this in the context of sex differences is that this is only for males, okay? So we only do this in males because this is a Y chromosome that we're studying, okay? So these are two different versions of a Y chromosome. And we know now that this Y chromosome is only helping the males. We don't know what it's doing. We don't know what the equivalent thing happening in females is, 
And so this is where I say, I don't know. And this is something we're trying to understand. Okay, so we're trying to understand now, do females have similar patterns as males? Or is there something different going on? All right, so, um, so to get kind of back to somewhere where we started, we have all this variation across species, which we try to understand in the context of evolution and natural selection. And one way we can study it is by looking at variation within species. For example, in these dogs, or um, if you're a pigeon fancier in, in the various breeds of pigeon. Okay, so remember I told you there was a question at the beginning of the talk, right? So on the variation within animal species, the question is, is that variation caused by natural selection or is something else going on? So first of all, I think it's important to point out that it may depend on what we mean by variation, right? So we illustrated here that there's some effect of, or some relationship between genetic variation and phenotypic variation, but this is somewhere where we need more work. We need a better understanding of this relationship in order to answer that question up there. Um, now, if we wanna get at what role natural selection might play in maintaining variation, we know that what we'll call local adaptation or variation across habitats could be important. And so you might maintain variation simply because you have one, site, one genotype that's really good in one habitat and another genotype that's really good in the, another habitat. And the variation is maintained because you can't just have the, the, the mountaintop ha uh, genotype found everywhere because they wouldn't survive in the coast. And you can't have the coastal genotype everywhere because it wouldn't survive in the mountain, right? And adding on top, or, or in, in addition to this environmental variation, we might also need to uh, consider differences between males and females as a way for variation to be maintained. So if males and females are different, you might have different things maintained depending on whether you want to be male, whether, whether the thing is found in males or females. Um, and then that difference between males and females may also differ across habitats. And so you have this um, local adaptation that might differ between males and females. And so putting it all here, we have our phenotype or our fitness and variation in that phenotype might depend on the genetics underlying the phenotype, as well as the environmental variation that the species encounters and differences between males and females in what is optimal for um, those different environments. All right, so that is all I had to say. Thank you so much for your time.